Praise God. Well, at Radiant Springs Church, we believe we exist to lead, love, and connect people to a life-changing relationship with Christ. And that, to me, that life-changing part is the, a really important part because if, if we're just going to a church, we're part of religion, what we would call religion, and it's lifeless, it's dead, it's not changing our life, there's no excitement there, then we miss the point, right? We want to lead people in that relationship with Christ so that they can know Christ on a daily basis. Amen? Amen. Um, and our value this week is excellence and integrity. We envision a place where people can discover their strengths to serve God and serve uh, their community with purpose. And actually, that is the wrong one. Excellence and integrity is... Uh, there we go, is welcoming an environment where people can experience God. But maybe I was supposed to go with this other one. So, um, But we envision a welcoming environment where people can experience God. Amen? Um, praise God. It was about this time last year that we were doing the remodeling of the floors and the bathrooms. So, right? We were jumping into that. And uh, some of you, I we probably should bring that up video up, right, of you guys pulling up carpet. And, yeah, there was some... Yeah, some good pictures there and doing the demo. You guys enjoyed the demo work, right? And then I put it back together, but yeah. And Aaron, we had Aaron there. Ramon, yeah. Amen. Well, praise God. We want to take up the Lord's tithe and His offerings. We do appreciate your um, um, faithfulness in the area of giving. It is an opportunity for, to worship God um, through uh, our giving, what God has blessed us with. And, you know, God gives to us um, gifts, talents, ability, uh, resources. Sometimes we think it all comes, it's all dependent upon me, but God is the one that gives us the, the mind, the ability to go out and, and make a earning for ourselves, to provide for ourselves. Gary, I'm going to have you come over this way. And so uh, we do appreciate your faithfulness. It helps us do some great things. Um, and so I'm going to have Gary pray for the offering, but he's also going to share a word of testimony. Is that okay if we put it right here? Um, but uh, one of the things that I want to do, do a better job is just celebrating um, your guys' generosity. And one of the things, we just finished up our camp season, so we took kids to, to youth and kids. So we were able to scholarship, um, I think, five or six kids, so to the tune of over, it was like $1,110 came in in scholarships to send kids to camp. So can you guys give yourself a hand? Amen. And uh, that was because you guys uh, gave above and beyond and uh, helped to make a difference in the life of kids. Um, and so, uh, Gary, I'm going to have you pray for the offering, but he also just wanted, this is your first Sunday back in, in s probably a couple months, and because uh, uh, Mary's been uh, going through her lymphoma treatments and chemo. Um, some good progress there. I'm going to let you just share what God is doing. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> just keep talking. For all your generosity, there it is. <laughs> I want to thank you for all your generosity, your visits, and your true love and caring for Mary. She really appreciates it. It's total blessings. Now, here's something that happened to her, and she shared it with me, and I think I should share it with you. She was actually taking a shower, and she was and her hair back and she came up with a whole handful of hair and you know she knew that she probably gonna lose her hair but she didn't think it would bother her but it did <laughs> but it did said she started crying in the shower and she asked God to just give her strength you know to do what she needed to do and she said clearly the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said you have to be willing to give up the old to be, receive God's blessings, not be attached to your hair or anything else in your past. She came out and told me that, and I said, you know, there may be a lot to that, because what do we do? You know, we've been, you know, we've been saved, born again. God forgave your sins, right? And you can accept that. But can you forgive yourself for things in your past? Or can you forgive other people that you hold something against from something they did for you, to you in your past? That's all negative. That's not God's way. So what we need to do is not speak it, 
put that stuff behind us if we want God's blessings. Makes sense, doesn't it? So thank you. (laughs) So let's pray over this offering. Lord, we thank you for this day to come together. We thank you for the opportunity to, to give and to give back a little bit of what you give us. We thank you, and we ask that go to your to fulfill your purpose on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And, and Mary has a new nickname, right? She does have a look, new nickname. I, Her name is Curly. Curly. <laughs> <laughs> so after God had kind of spoke that to her, they talked to with another lady that was also in treatment, and she lost her hair, but when it came back, it came back thick and curly. <laughs> so she's believing for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're speaking. <laughs> All right. Hey Amen. We're going to turn these guys loose here. Here, Gary. And uh, um, amen. Praise God. And uh, if, if you want to bring up, uh, he has the QR code there. If you want to bring up the loop bulletin, you can do that. And in there on the loop bulletin is a place to sign up for the meal train for Mary. And I think there's been probably two, three meals a week. I don't know. And people have been going out there and, and uh, providing for them. And um, probably the fellowship and the meals are both important, right? And uh, uh, seeing her. But Mary is um, seeing her now compared to before her first treatment. There's, to me, there's a night and day difference. So, And uh, praise God. And she doesn't look too bad with her head shaved. So. You know that you are probably comfortable around your pastor if you're willing to be in front of them as a lady and have your head shaved, right? All right. Yeah. No, she looked good. All right. Um, we want to highlight a few other things. So next Sunday is what? Water baptism Sunday, all right? And so we will meet here at 10 o'clock. We'll do our worship service, the preliminary stuff. And then we're going to head out to Walnut Creek after that. Um, We'll do the baptisms and the picnic, all right? And so you can sign up in the loop bulletin for that. There's also a sign-up sheet at the welcome table uh, if you want to take advantage of that as well. So two two ways that you can sign up for that. But usually you bring kind of like a main dish and a salad or dessert. So um, uh, we will have a grill out there. And so if you want to bring hot dogs, hamburgers, that, those are the type of things that we grill. Unless you want to smoke a brisket or something like that beforehand and bring it out. I think somebody did that one year. Um, we'll grill that, but then also then, so that'll take care of the meat, but we'll need buns to go with those. And then um, like salads, watermelon, bottled water, things like that. So those are some of the things you can sign up for. All right. Uh, got the connect card, water baptism. You can sign up to be baptized. We have several that are getting baptized in water. And so you can sign up there as well on the loop bulletin for that. Small groups are happening this week. And so Aaron and Sharonda, you got tonight. Are we doing tonight? Okay, tonight. They've been having a great response, 6 o'clock here at the church on Sunday nights. Uh, just a good time of fellowship. Um, and then um, ours on Wednesday night is actually going to meet Tuesday, Tuesday at 7 this week. Um, that was going to work out better for people Tuesday at 7. So uh, is that right, Marie? Yes. It is right. All right. Okay. And uh, all right. Did I get it all? I think I got it all. It's good to have Pastor Andy back. And um, I'm going to have him dismiss the kiddos, but maybe he just wants to share a word about kids camp. I don't. You didn't get to do that because you weren't feeling well after camp. Well, yeah, I wasn't. We, 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 yeah, we caught... Um, the COVID again, <laughs> but we're good. We're good. We're recovered. Amen. God's good. Uh, no, uh, yeah, and I was kind of bummed out because I wanted to share what what God had done in the kids' lives, and He had done some powerful things, not just in the service, but through everything we did, whether it was games or talking with the kids, and not just our kids, but all the kids there. And um, so, and actually, I'll just share what one of the kids said uh, in regards to an idol. I, he shared it on one service. Um, he said, idols aren't as, sh- they seem true, but they're not as true as they seem to be. And I was like, excuse me, did you just say that? Wow, this kid has some understanding of what God, w- I mean, what cl- God was clearly speaking to him. But I was just, I was like, wow, this, this guy must have went to a theology class or something and studied some of God's word. No, I was, I was moved just because um, one, one of the kids that went in with us, um, he came from our church and, 
um, it was just cool to see that God was working in his life, and not only his life, but each of the kids' lives, and so it's just a beautiful thing, and um, yeah, I, I think that's pretty much all I have. I, I, uh, if the if the kids want to share something, they're welcome to, but not all of them are here. I know Hazel and Nora were here yeah. or there, and uh, we have a couple other kids that are out that aren't here. So. I was going to say that I saw Gabe, Georgia, where are you at there? I saw Gabe at Walmart yesterday, and he was with uh, Carlina. And they were going through Walmart, and he saw me down the aisle, and he got this big smile on his face, and so I gave him a fist bump, and we talked. But camp, I think, was pretty powerful, pro- powerful for him, and uh, he's going into the next grade. And, you know, just, um, you know, he, he's been part of our church because people have taken that opportunity to pick him up on Sundays and bring him here. So um, God's making a difference in his life, so. Good. Amen. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and dismiss. And uh, kids, you can use the bathroom. Preschool will still meet with Amy and the nursery still staff. And I'll meet the kids in the back. We'll come back in a few minutes here. Thank you, guys. All right. Galatians chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning. I talk about freedom. And that's what I basically entitled the message is freedom. Uh, tomorrow is the 4th of July, Independence Day, right? I think. The way it sounded last night, I think it felt like it was the 4th of July around our place, but uh, there's a lot of fireworks going off down the street, and yeah, it, it was going, yeah, yeah. All right. What's that? It is. Galatians 5, 1 through 26 is where we're going to be at today. You know, the 4th of July is a day we celebrate our independence as a nation. And few countries in the world enjoy the freedoms that we do have a nation, right? Uh, We are by no means perfect. And I think daily our nation wrestles with that concept of what is that pursuit of truth, liberty, and justice for all, right? I think that's something that's still ongoing. And we're still trying to um, perfect that. Uh, The framers of our Constitution tried to put in place checks and balances to protect the freedoms and to protect from one person or one group using their power towards their own advantage. And we see that struggle, right? Uh, Even right now, if you look at the news, you see the struggle between the Supreme Court, the president, the legislative arm, and, and we, the people of the United States. There's that wrestle there, isn't there? Um, and so, um, I think that wrestling, sometimes we don't always like that, but I think in that, um, that's what our freedom is all about. And, um, and that's where you kind of come to the middle and find out what is best and that what works for us as a nation. So, freedom is one of the reasons that people come to our nation from other nations of the world, isn't it? Um, sometimes it's for the prosperity part of it. Um, but a lot of times they want the freedoms, the safety, the justice that we have to offer here in our nation. So, um, and so as we think about that, the Bible has a lot to say about freedom. Uh, just like the people that came from England, the Puritans and others that came from England to settle in this nation uh, seeking religious freedom, right? Um, as they came... Um, I believe Scripture, Jesus also came to give us freedom and to have a life that is abundant and full. Amen? So I want us to look at Galatians because it does talk about this concept of freedom and what that means for us and what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary so that we could live free. Amen? So let's look to the Lord in prayer and then we're going to dive into Galatians uh, chapter 5. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the beautiful time of the year. We thank you for the freedom of our nation. And Lord God, we still continue to we pray for our nation, um, that you would have your hand upon it. We have songs that talk about God bless America. And Lord God, um, we know um, sometimes all that is, it seems like in a balance. And Lord God, um, we need to pray for our nation and we need to be the people of God and pray for our leaders. Um, because the liberties that we have, we cannot take them for granted. And um, um, they need protecting. They need to be maintained as well. And so, Lord God, we lift up our nation and we lift up our time as we study your word. Um, it is the living word of God. And we pray and ask it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Galatians 5. So, Galatians and Romans have a lot in common. And so, I'm going to 
maybe refer to Romans once. Uh, Romans definitely is like two, three times as big as Galatians as far as content. But there is some overlap there. Um, but Paul, when he ministers, a little bit of a backdrop, he's, he went into um, to reach the Gentiles. And so when he would go north into what is now modern-day Turkey, Back then it would be referred to as Asia, and then he'd go into Macedonia, down to Athens and Corinth. Um, Ephesus would be in modern-day Turkey. Um, he'd go into those places. Where was the first place that he went as he entered a community? Where would he share Christ first? The synagogue. Yeah, he'd go to the Jewish synagogue, and when they would kick him out, <laughs> then he would go to the, the Gentiles. And he did that out of respect for the Jewish people and their heritage. And so he would go into that. His primary focus was the Gentile people, but both Jews and Gentiles would come to know the Lord um, under his ministry. But for those that came out of a Jewish heritage, they had gotten into to a place where they followed the, what we'd call the law. Okay, And you'll read that. In the New Testament, Paul talks about the law a lot. And so that would really be found in our first five books of the Bible, okay? The Torah, we would call the Ten Commandments being part of that. Okay, that was the law for them. And so Leviticus and, and some of those books, that was the law. But it even had become more than that. The religious leaders had added on to what God was asking of people. And that's what Jesus would confront when he would walk the earth is that he would confront some of their legalism and some of the, the burdens that they had placed upon people and say, you need, you need to do this as well to fulfill the law of Christ. All right, so when we look at Galatians and we begin chapter 5, we're kind of jumping in towards the latter part of the book of Galatians. Um, he is dealing with believers that are dealing with slavery to legalism to the law okay and they're seeing that as a means of their righteousness now we may, we may not have that jewish background and heritage and we don't have that understanding but i can guarantee you that your neighbors and maybe even yourself have thought you know what i'm going to make it to heaven based upon the good that i have done right in fact, you even look at your life and your righteousness and your holiness and you're thinking about this is what I did, this is what I didn't do. Right? We base it upon our works. Now, our works should be a fruit of our relationship with God. But the song that you guys, the, the third song there ever be, I think, says you've clothed me with white clothes, right? You've clothed me in white or whatever, right? That. That's, that's taken from Revelations, right? That He's clothed us with His righteousness. Now, does that come from our good works? No, it comes from His righteousness that He gives to us by faith and grace, right? And so we have to keep that concept in mind as we read this. So let's look at this together. It is, Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. So that's a good verse to underline. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. You know, that it's interesting that times we can experience freedom and we want to go back. Think of the Egyptians. They get out of, they get, I mean not the Egyptians, the Israelites. They get out of Egypt, right? And they get there and things get a little bit difficult. And they say, hey, we want to go back into bondage, right? At least we had garlic there, right? <laughs> we had garlic and some fresh vegetables. But we want to go back into our bondage. How easy it can be. Verse 2, mark my words. I, I, Paul, tell you that to let yourselves, if you let yourselves be circumcised, so that was one of the signs of that you were the Jew, a Jewish and that you were a God-fearer. Okay? So even sometimes Gentiles would become circumcised and become part of the Jewish faith. But that circumcision be, kind of became that outward representation that I am a Jew. All right? And that I belong to God. All right. It kind of took a place, you know, you could be circumcised but still have evil in your heart and you could still be a rotten person, right? But hey, I'm circumcised, right? And I'm, therefore I'm right before God. And so um, he's dealing with that. Christ, if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, so some of these believers are being pressured 
by what were called Judaizers. They were people that were part of the Jewish faith and they still held on to those remnants that maybe they had accepted Christ, but they were still relying upon the law to make them holy. And if you're going to be a good Christian, you have to be circumcised, all right? Okay. He says, if you allow yourself to be circumcised, Christ will be no value to you at all. Now, today in America and other parts of the world, mom and dad make that decision when their boy is born, if they're going to circumcise or not. It usually has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. It has more to do about hygiene and, and preference and things like that. All right? Okay? But for them, it had to do some spiritual ramifications. Verse 3, again, I declare to every... Every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated now to obey the whole law, all of it. You are trying to be justified by the law and have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. So they were depending upon this external righteousness that was by following the law by works instead of God's grace by faith. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcised or uncircumcised has any value. So it's a non-issue. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Another good verse to underline. You are running a good race. Can you get that picture? You're running a good race, right? You're out in front. You're out in the lead. And then all of a sudden, somebody cuts in on you, trips you up provides an obstruction. Somebody cut in to keep you from obeying the truth. What kind of uh, persuasion does not come from the one who calls you? A little yeast works its way through the whole dough. So some of this teaching was working its way into the Christian community, and Paul is trying to get that out. Okay, It only takes a little bit of yeast right, to do a whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will Take no other view. The one who has thrown you into confusion, whoever it may be, will have to pay for the penalty. Brothers and sisters, I am still preaching circumcision. Um, Why am I being persecuted? So he's asking the question here. In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way. (laughs) Paul has a little bit of sense of humor. And uh, so, and... uh, kind of slip with their knife and take off more than was necessary, right? All right. All right. (laughs) He has a little mean spirit in there, doesn't he? Yeah. Did you know that was in the Bible? Yeah. All right. All right. Now you do. (laughs) All right. What I want to point out here is be careful how you handle a knife. No. Uh, (laughs) No. Freedom is costly. It's never free, is it? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You know, when we even think about the freedom of our nation, our freedom in Christ, either you paid the price or someone else did, right? For the freedoms that we enjoy. Um, People laid their life. You watch what's happening in Ukraine as they fight for their independence, their freedom. Um, They're paying a high price, aren't they? They're paying a high price. And we look at that and we maybe even cringe at the sacrifice that they're making. But we had people that formed this nation that made some of those same sacrifices, did they not? Each day there's a cost to maintaining the freedom that we enjoy as a nation. And in regards to our spiritual freedom, it, it was Jesus who gave his life on the cross so that we could have forgiveness of sin and live a life of freedom. So he went to the cross for us. He took the price upon himself, right? He says he took our sin upon himself. He didn't do anything wrong when he died on the cross. That was reserved for criminals and thieves. So he, he took our sin upon himself and paid the price for that, which was death on the cross. The first point that I want to just bring out here is that freedom is costly, so live responsibly. We have freedom in Christ, but that also requires us to live responsibly and to understand that we need to put our faith in Christ and trust in Him alone um, and not be deceived or led astray or take it for granted. 
The New Living Translation, verse 1 says, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure you stay free and don't get tied up again in the slavery of the law. You know, um, we talked a little bit. For them, it was circumcision seemed to be the big thing. And so these people, these new believers are getting saved. They're probably getting saved out of, of Judaism. Um, some of them maybe even came from a Gentile population. And now there's these Judaizers, people that had accepted Christ, but they still felt like in order for you to be saved, you have to be circumcised. Okay? It was kind of like maybe back in the hippie days, when the, in the hippies, okay, and back in the 70s, okay? Um, I was a little bit young then, but I still remember some of that. But a lot of them came to know Christ, right? A lot of them came to know Christ. And they came into churches, and what were they asked to do many times? Cut your hair, right? Put on that suit. Why? Some of those, sometimes those external things we think make somebody holy and righteous before God. That's, I don't think that matters at all. What matters is if our heart is clean, right? Um, Paul calls it circumcision of the heart. That's what he talks about that in Romans 2, that our heart is clean and all the evil has been removed there. Um, today, you know what, we can, it's maybe not circumcision that's the issue for us, and I probably doubt that for many of them, us that is the issue. But we, we sometimes think, you know what, if I do community service, if I give a generous donation here or there, or if I do this or do that, if I'm better than my neighbor down the street, then somehow, before God, I am righteous and I'm holy. I'm definitely better than the other person that I know, right? Okay? And so we sometimes can easily fall into that trap, and sometimes we use it to establish our standing before God, but sometimes we look at our life too, and we are... We go, man, I'm, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner and no good for nothing. And, all right? And, and that's not good either. Why? Because then you're not going to be confident before God. You're not going to be doing what God has called you to do because you're never going to feel worthy, right? And you have to find that place where we stand in God's grace by faith, knowing that we are clothed in white, not because of anything that we've done, but because of who He is and what He's done for us. And then we live a good life. We do good acts of righteousness and fruit because of what He has done. It's a fruit. It's a fruit of what God has done in our life. Okay? So if you do it the opposite way, you look good on the outside, you act nice when people are around you or when you know your pastor's around. All right? Right? You do those things, right? But it's all external, right? Instead of letting it be internal and working its way inside out. Okay, follow me? You guys are getting it. I can tell. All right, Galatians 2, 20 through 21 says, Paul says, For through the law I have died to the law so that I might live for God. I love this passage. For I have been crucified in Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live now in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could have been gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And if anybody probably wrestled with this idea of following the law, guess who it was? It was Paul, right? Philippians, if you go to the book of Philippians, he talks about he was a Jew of Jews. He was from the right tribe and he was zealous and he had all the right qualifications and that's what he was basing his righteousness upon. So if there was anybody that had to wrestle with this, it was Paul. And, but he came to that place, he realized, you know what, none of it was good enough. It was all, there again in Philippians, he says it was like uh, refuse, you know, cow dung, cow patties, right? It, it just wasn't of any value. What was valuable was that he knew Christ and the power of his resurrection in his life. Amen? Um, because our freedom was costly, we should live our lives in a responsible way it is by grace through faith giving god glory and praise along the way amen let's look at verses 13 through 15 he then goes on to say you my brothers and sisters were called to be free do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh rather serve one another humbly in love for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command love your neighbor as yourself those are the words of jesus right and if you bite and devour one another that's kind of a very vivid picture. 
Watch out or you will, be dis- you will destroy each other. You know what? Our freedom must be governed by love. Why? Why? Because our freedom, if pushed too far, can, too far, can negatively impact other people or other believers, can we? Our freedoms pushed too far can infringe on the other people's rights. All right. Um, so think of the neighbor. You know, every every winter you see this one neighbor. You know, in the papers that decorates their house with all the lights and all the things, right? Okay, it's kind of cool to go look at. People then drive there. But so they maybe have a right to do that, right? All right. They have the freedom and the right to do that. But if you are their neighbor and you have to put drapes on your windows because of all the lights coming through, or you can't enjoy a peaceful yard because of all the traffic that's coming by to see the light display, or the music that accompanies it, right? then your freedom actually infringes on the freedoms of others, does it not? Um, But it doesn't happen in the church, I can guarantee that. (laughs) Paul does give some spiritual examples of this, what he's talking about here in Romans 14, so that's where I'm going to kind of refer to Romans. And I'm not going to take us there, but you can look at this later. In Romans 14, he gives a couple different examples where our personal freedom, can, in, if taken too far, can infringe on the freedoms of others. So he gives a couple examples. One was eating meat offered to idols. We're going to come back to that one. Drinking wine. Being a vegetarian. Wow. How could that be? Well, you know, if you have these convictions... And Colossians talks about that. If you have these convictions that, hey, if I'm going to be holy, I'm only going to eat vegetables, right? I'm going to do the Daniel plan. And if you don't do the Daniel plan with me, you are not spiritual. I can tell that, right? All right. Um, He also talked about observing sacred days. You know, if we were truly spiritual, we would be meeting on what day of the week? Saturday. Saturday. Because technically that was the Sabbath, wasn't it? And we worship on Sunday because... That's the day of the resurrection, right? Yeah. That's why Sunday was kind of selected. So let's look at a couple of these. Eating meat sacrificed to idols. So that was an issue that Paul had to deal with. Now, we probably don't deal with that much in our day and age. Maybe in some parts of the world, that is still an issue, okay? But um, so a lot of believers were getting saved from um, idolatry. So Ephesus, we know that God did this incredible revival in the city of Ephesus, and idolatry was a big thing. And so um, they would make these sacrifices at these heathen temples. They didn't use all the meat. They would sell it then to the meat market out in the markets there, and people would buy it, okay? And I don't know if there was a, like a, uh, some kind of note there saying sacrifice to this God or this God or, you know, came from the market. I don't know if it was. I have a feeling that people knew where the meat had come from, right? So for some people that had come out of idolatry, okay, and that had been part of their way of life, to then go and eat that meat that had been sacrificed to those gods was maybe still kind of a sensitive issue for them. Either they had strong convictions against it, or maybe it would be tempting them to go back into that way of life that God had delivered them from. So we know that there were people that had strong convictions about that. Now there's others that said, you know what, I've been set free, I can eat that meat. You know, those gods, they're false gods. They're nothing compared to the Jehovah, to God, Yahweh. That's nothing, right? And so they said, man, meat's meat. I'm going to eat it, right? And so they would eat it. So they had the freedom and the liberty and the conscience that it didn't bother them. So who was right? Probably neither one was. It's just their convictions, right? And what Paul would instruct them to say, you know what, if you have the conviction that you can eat that meat offered to idols and it's not going to bother you, it's not going to drag you back into that lifestyle, maybe it wasn't even part of your life and it, it means nothing to you and you are able to live in that freedom, great. But if you're having a family over that has convictions about that or you know that that's going to bother them, don't push your freedom to infringe upon their standing in Christ. Are you following me? Now, one that maybe is a little more um, relevant to us would be like the wine or the alcohol. You know, we we know that Jesus had 
you know, he had wine and there's, you know, it probably wasn't the, the proof alcohol level that it is today. We've perfected that. Um, and they would often dilute it. So we know that, but he still, he still drank wine. And often I wonder if it, the, the wine didn't help purify the water because the water quality was, was of such that it wasn't the best. But we know that he, he did drink alcohol. And it was part of that culture. But we also, you know, Paul has to tell Timothy, he says, hey, you have a stomach that's giving you issues. Why don't you have a little bit of wine with it? So it almost makes you wonder that at that point in the church, and especially where Paul was ministering, that they had taken more of an abstinence approach because of the dangers of alcohol, right? We know that Paul deals explicitly about drunkenness. He refers to that and his do's and don'ts and drunkenness is constantly brought up and things that come from that. We're going to get to that part. And so um, he also talks about that, that wine thing. He says, you know what, you may have the conviction that you can have a drink here and there and it doesn't bother you, but there's others that maybe have come out of alcoholism or drunkenness and that's part of their past and they have convictions about that so if you're in their presence it wouldn't be good of you christian like of you to say hey i'm going to drink in front of you whether you like it or not right and that still applies for us today right people constantly are being coming out of a lifestyle of alcoholism where it had a hold in their life and you know you can't walk the fence when you've come out of alcoholism, right? You step one foot back in and you're, it's going to pull you all the way back in again, right? And if you're going to be a good believer in Christ, you're going to recognize that and do what is right. Um, you follow me? So our freedom can then be something that we uh, abuse and if it's not governed by love, it can just do harm within the body of Christ. And that's what Paul is talking about that. And I totally lost track of my notes here. So um, the principle I want us to get at is that freedom is empowering, so serve humbly. Freedom is empowering, so serve humbly. You know, maybe even, so the last week or two, Roe versus Wade was turned over, right? Okay, so a lot of you are happy about that, right? I am, yeah. Okay. But I think some Christians have kind of pushed that too far. I think they've pushed it too far. And I think the stance that we need to have as the church is, you know what? We may be happy that life is being upheld, right? And uh, that we're going to do a little bit better job of protecting the life of the unborn. But there's still a great need there, right? For for women that maybe have that unplanned pregnancy. Did you know that a lot of abortions happen through fertilization technologies, right? Okay. Mom and dad can't have a kid, so they go in and they have in vitro, right? And so they don't just put one embryo in there. They put in five, six, ten, right? So obviously the mom and dad don't want to have what's ten kids, I don't know. They don't want to have them all, so then what do they do? Then they, they selectively remove some of those and get it down to maybe one or two. Okay? I don't think they put in probably ten, but they, prob they put in several and they narrow it down to one or two. Right? Okay? So sometimes it happens in that process. Sometimes it happens in a, just an unplanned pregnancy. I still remember, uh, this was early on in our first uh, ministry assignment up in North Dakota, and a, a guy that held a job in the community in the county um, is a you know significant job and I just remember him coming and knocking on the door it's the middle of winter because I still remember the parka that he had on and this had the fur parka you know hood, hoodie and he came and knocked on the door and he says um, he was just he was broken you could tell he was just crushed and he says um, our, our daughter 16 year old daughter is pregnant it was their oldest oldest child uh, they had a boy a um, daughter and a son. And, um, and I just remember we walked them through that time. We found a pregnancy center uh, that was in a larger town, a pregnancy center that then provided some resources and counseling, and they um, got through that time. They kept, uh, she kept the child. I think there was even the option, they kind of weighed it out. Do we want to put 
this child up for adoption or do we want to keep her? They decided to keep. It ended up being a baby girl. Um, you know, now I see their family pictures right now on Facebook. And not only do you have the mom and dad, but then you have the daughter. And she's remarried or she got married, not to the f- father, to another man. But she got married and now the daughter, the daughter that was born um, earlier now is married and has their own child. So, and they're doing well. And so those things happen, and, but you have to handle those things with compassion and love, right? Um, and so as the church, we can rejoice in what was handed down and what is happening, but I also think that we need to have a little bit of humility there and some compassion towards the world around us. And um, there is going to be some needs that are there, and are we willing to step in and be there for people? Amen? Amen. Freedom is empowering, so serve humbly. We need to keep that humble attitude that if if our freedom means that I'm going to impact another believer in a negative way and harm them, then I need to back off of my freedom because love needs to be the governor that keeps it in check. We found it? And as a nation, we have a lot of freedoms, but even those freedoms have to have, we have guidelines there because they have to be kept in check, right? We can carry our freedom too far, all right? Number three, verses 16 through 26. Let's bring it home, Pastor Brent. We need to get it done here, all right. All right, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. No way. Is that true? It is, isn't it? And the Spirit, what is contrary to the flesh, they are in conflict with one another. They're button heads. And they're in conflict with one another. So you, do, you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the, the flesh. Now, I want to say, your Bible maybe says something different. This is the newer version of the NIV. It says flesh. I don't really like that term flesh, okay? Because it kind of gives you the, ident- the feeling that your flesh is somehow evil, okay? It's not, okay? It's human, okay? What is tainted is your sinful nature. There's that nature within us that is part of our humanness that has that bent towards sinning. And we see that at birth, and we see that as a child it gets to the age that they can understand mom and dad, and when mom says or dad says do this, they go, "Uh uh-uh, right? So it's in there, that sinful nature. So I prefer more that idea. You can understand, you know, when that uses the word flesh, it means that sinful nature, okay? Verse 19, um, so the acts of sinful nature are obvious of the flesh. Sexual morality, so that is sex outside of marriage. I don't care if it's sleeping around before you get married. I don't care if it's you're married and you're not faithful to your spouse. Anything like that. Impurity, okay, that's just your evilness in your heart. Debauchery is behavior that happens because you've had too much to drink. Idolatry, you're worshiping other gods. Okay, witchcraft. So that'd get into Satanism and witchcraft. I don't have to define that. Hatred. Man, hatred's in there, man. You hate your brother, your sister, somebody else. That's put in there. Discord, division. Jealousy. Right? We never get that when we were on Facebook, right? All right. Man, they went there. They got that. Just saying. Okay. Fits of rage. A little temper tantrum. Selfish ambition. I'm going to go out there and make a name for myself. I don't care who gets hurt along the way. Dissensions. Factions. Envy. Drunkenness. Orgies. Okay. And the like. As I warned you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, some of these we would really land hard on, say, yeah, you can't be having orgies or you can't be doing the witchcraft. But you have to understand impurity, hatred, envy is also on the list. All right? Then he goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing there is no law. At least the last time I checked, there wasn't any laws. Hey, you can't be joyful, right? You can't be kind to your neighbor. You can't practice self-control. That just is not right, right? There's no laws against those, right? Barb is 
she's giving me that look like she's thinking about this. All right. <laughs> she's going to fact check it for me. All right. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. So it goes back to that Galatians chapter 2, I've been crucified with Christ. Since we have lived by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit and let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. All right, so let's look at this. Point number three, our freedom can actually become um, destructive to others and to us. And so... Um, our freedom, our freedom. In Christ, He has set us free, right? But in that freedom, we can actually kind of go backwards into different things. Example, okay? If you happen to just have bought an, an espresso machine and <laughs> say, I have the right in the freedom, I'm going to have six Nespresso's or espressos, right? Now, do you have the right to do that? Is there any laws against that? No, no, but you might be a little... <laughs> Somebody did, so... They didn't have six of them, though. No. I'm just making light of it. But our freedoms, we can actually take ourselves into the place where our freedom can do harm into our life. You have the freedom to go to Dairy Queen and get as many blizzards as you can afford and eat them. But it may not be the best thing for you. Are you following me? In Romans 6, 1-4, through 4, it states that God's grace and freedom is not there to be a license to sin. So God had set them free, right? And when God's grace is there. It's to help us to grow in grace to not be destroyed, that we can mature, make mistakes along the way. But God's grace is not there so that we can go out and sin because God's grace is going to cover it. You following me? And that's what the, he's talking about to the Romans and even a little bit to the Galatians that, you know what, God's grace is there so for your benefit, but it's not there so that I can go out and say, hey, I can go out and do this, I can do this. God's going to forgive me, right? It's not there because you enslave yourself all over again to the things that held you. Rules are nice because it gives you this black and white. You can do this, you can't do that. But in the gray areas, we also need, I mean, there's certain things in Scripture that are black and white. And we just covered those. I just read those, right? But, there's still some of the areas that are gray areas. We call them gray areas. And we need the Holy Spirit in our heart to guide and direct us. In the Old Testament, Jesus says the law of the Lord was written upon the stone tablets, right? Ten Commandments. But he says in the New Testament, I'm going to write my law, my commands upon our hearts. How does he do that? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to guide us. And so we may be hanging out with friends and doing things there. And all of a sudden, hey, they say, hey, let's go and do this. Okay? We've got some young people here. And they are listening to me. Right? They are listening. Right? Yes. They're listening to me. Right? And they got friends that say, hey, let's go do this. And it's kind of like all of a sudden you just kind of get this, mm, it just doesn't sit right in here. Right? It's kind of like you get, I don't know if we should do that. That is the Holy Spirit being our guide helping us to make the decision between right and wrong. The third principle is freedom is elusive, so walk in step with the Spirit. It's elusive. Maintaining the freedom that we have in Christ is an ongoing battle. We need the wisdom in our lives in a way that is healthy for our body, our soul, and our mind. If we follow our natural tendency, it's going to lead us into the things that we see in, in verses 19 through 21. Okay? If we just kind of go with what feels good, what we want, what our sinful nature wants, this is going to be the result. It's going to be the impurity, the debauchery, the idolatry, the hatred. right? But if we follow and keep in step with the Holy Spirit that God has placed in us at the moment of salvation, then we're going to have love, joy, peace, kindness, and self-control, the things of the Spirit. I want to close with one final illustration. I was just thinking about this. Um, 
and have the musicians come. But, you know, a, a good illustration of this is when kids go to college, right? So they've been in the home. There's rules. There's guidelines, right? There's that structure. And then all of a sudden they go to college. Woo, they got freedom, right? Mom and dad aren't there. I can do whatever I want, right? Got freedom, right? But sometimes that freedom isn't a good thing, right? It's not a good thing. I see it happen all the time to students that go to Doan, especially one that have come out of a Christian background in church. And maybe get a call saying, hey, this person's going to come. And uh, some of them do really well. So we've had one that's been really connected this past year and doing well. Um, but some of them not so much because they get into that environment where there's freedom. Now they have decisions and choices that they have to make on their own, whether good or bad. And it's still allowing that Holy Spirit to guide and direct them and to find their way. You follow me? Um, And so we can maybe look at that situation, but it's the same for all of us. That God wants to perfect us. He wants to lead us into freedom. He wants us to experience freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, right? But we are to use our freedom to glorify God, to bless others. And our freedom, in order to do that, our freedom must be tempered by love and humility. And when it is, it will be a blessing to the lives of our life, but also to the lives of others. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to lead us in a prayer of salvation. Would you stand this morning? Um, Praise God. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and your Savior, um, we want to give you that opportunity to know His freedom in your life. And so I'm going to encourage us just to pray together. And if that's today's your day, um, the prayer of salvation. So would you pray with me saying, Dear God, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Be my Lord and my Savior. And set me free to worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And Lord, I pray your your hand upon each of us. Just as we um, look to you in worship one more time, Father, I pray that you would take your word and apply it to our heart and our life. That we can truly live in the freedom and the grace that has been provided through Christ Jesus. And Lord, if we've been trying to attain our own righteousness through the things that we've done, Lord, that you would set us free from that and just to lean into your grace by faith and to run for you, Lord God. Run in a way that is free, that is joyful, that is liberating, to glorify you in all that we do, Lord God, and to know that joy and happiness that is yours through Christ Jesus. We give you the thanks. We ask in your name. Lord, this morning, as we go into this week, I just pray you would bless our gatherings for the 4th of July. Um, Just bless those times together with family, with friends, Lord. And Lord God, be the wind within our sails. Lord God, carry us, strengthen us. Be our anchor in the, the stormy seas, Lord. Go with us, Lord, let your presence be with us, Lord God. And Let us walk in the freedom that you've given us, Lord God. May we glorify you and bless those that we are on the journey with, Lord. We give you the thanks and the praise we ask in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Hey, good to have you here this morning. Hey, let's give give a hand for Sean there on the drums. Thank you, Sean. So he's our guest this morning and a friend of uh, Denise's. And uh, so, hey, God bless you this morning. Greet each other as you leave.